Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle. I am joined by my co-host, Michael Hall. Tonight, the title of tonight's episode is the Carolina Forecast. And so the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. In order to prep for this uh, Carolina uh, meetup, you could say a storm, you could say, we want to bring in our friend of the pod, Mr. Ryan Fowler of Bleach Report. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Ryan. How you doing? I'm doing well, as always. Guys, appreciate you having me on. Yes, sir. First order of business, Ryan. Before we get into Carolina, um, Washington, not only did they lose to the Ravens, obviously, last week, but that is behind us. But they also lost uh, Jonathan Allen for the season. Dorrance Armstrong was in the hospital yesterday, but he wasn't put on IR or anything like that. But how big of a loss is that of those two guys heading – towards now further down the season uh, i'll be honest guys i think the loss of uh of Dorrance armstrong is going to be bigger uh for this football team now that's not any slight to jonathan allen um what he's been since 2017 has been outstanding now i think we can talk a lot about the last 18 months or so we're really leaving 18 games or so of what we've seen from john allen next to deron Payne. um it has not been enough within the interior away from double teams and all the other stuff it's just not enough good play within the middle. Um, but, you know, everything in my mind, I feel like happens for a reason. And, you know, they took an opportunity to draft a guy like Johnny Newton early on day two sitting there. And I know we even talked about a couple months ago as far as is that potentially the future, right? Deron Payne and Johnny Newton there with Phil Mathis. And he's been really good rotationally for this ball club so far. So right now, I, I do think at the John Allen loss, I think Johnny Newton's going to get a heck of an opportunity. I can't wait to see him play. And then at edge, you know, there's it's a big question, right? They're going to have to add more talent moving forward into these next few free agent classes and the next few drafts to get some young pieces at that spot. So I think it is going to hurt. But right now, if I had to look at either of those guys, I will say right now that I think the Dorrance Armstrong injury with his ribs uh, is going to hurt a little bit more than what John Allen's is in the middle. Yeah, no, I agree, especially because if the those past couple of games, you could kind of see the uh, Dorrance Armstrong kind of starting to make an impact from the outside yeah. with his pass run and whatnot. So definitely going to be uh, get him back as soon as possible to help out this defense. But looking forward to uh, looking ahead to Carolina. Obviously, this defense has been not so good against the run. Losing Jonathan Allen obviously is going to um, extend accentuate that probably or hopefully, like you said, Johnny Newton steps up. But um, at the end of the day, they have a guy like Shuba Hubbard, who I think is like third or fourth in the league with rushing. Um, they have some guys on the outside as well that can kind of take the top off, give you some trouble. And with Andy Dalton back there, they kind of seem like a serviceable NFL offense as opposed to what they look like with Bryce Young. Out of those weapons on the outside or Chuba Hubbard, who scares you the most and who's going to have to uh, make the most impact defensively to kind of stop this offense? Yeah, I think it does start in the middle, and it's more so Bobby Wagner and Frankie Louvu this week. I think if you force Andy Dalton to beat you, uh, I think you're going to be in a good spot this week because, I mean, at any minute, I feel like Deontay Johnson could be dealt. Guys, I know there's, he's mm -hmm. been a name that's been thrown around teams, you know, day after day for the last, feel like, week, week and a half. Um, who knows if he's even out there on Sunday as of now. Um, he's obviously someone, again, has just thrown around these last few days as far as teams that are interested in adding that final piece on the outside. But I really do think you're forcing Andy Dalton to beat you this week. And it really starts with Luvu and Wagner because – Chuba Hubbard, you know, on the left side of that line, Damian Lewis, Iki Aquanu, who's been rough the first few years of his career, but he's, he's been better, at least in the run game early on this year. They give it to him on first down, second down, similar to what we see with Washington with those three backs that we've seen have an impact so far this year. And they want to get into those second and fives, third and threes, third and fours, to make it as easy as possible uh, for Andy Dalton under center because of the limited weapons he has on the outside. So I think... Stack in the box as much as you can. Carolina, as, as funny as it sounds, they faced a lot of too high this year, and they've run the ball well with Chuba. But just stack in the box a little bit and forcing Andy to beat you on the outside. Now that's a little bit of play with your poison there because the secondary group for Washington isn't great. But I think just forcing the veteran and Andy Dalton to beat you this week, 
I think we'll set up Washington to maybe take the ball away a little bit and get back in the hands of Jaden Daniels in this offense. Yeah, with Chuber, he's averaging right now five and over a five and a half yards per carry, yeah. only two touchdowns on the year. As a Chuba Hubbard fantasy owner, I could tell you that they do shy away from him later on in that game. It's not like they stick with him as their MO, and I think that has to do a lot with how many points that they give up. Right now, they're 22nd in the league in rushing yards per game with over 111 uh, per game right now. But let's talk a little bit about Jaden Daniels' progression. I, I thought some of his best throws of the season were where this past Sunday, he was like a sniper out there. Right now, let me list off some stats for you. In passing yards, he's ninth in the NFL right now with over 1,400. In interception uh, percentage, he's ninth. And then with sacks, he's tied for 11th. Passing and rushing yards included, he's fourth in the league right now. His completion percentage is first at 75.3%. Can you just talk a little bit about Jaden and through six games now, we kind of get more of a, an idea on him, Ryan. What are your feelings? Yeah, I think the bottom line is, guys, and we saw it really this past weekend, um, Washington's got a shot as long as number five's under center against anybody in football, uh, 100%. And I know you guys are super excited about what's to come if this young man stays healthy with this offense because this is year one of laying the foundation, and you went into Baltimore and you threw haymakers with Lamar Jackson in that group, and I think that's the biggest thing I took away from that ball game. But anyway, Jaden Daniels, I think I'm right there with you. I think some of the throws he made – this week were extremely impressive because we've talked about the poise. We've talked about his ability to push vertical. We've talked about his legs, but he's starting to manipulate defenders with his eyes. And also the funny narrative heading into this year was Jaden Daniels doesn't throw over the middle of the field. Well, it's really funny because if I had Brian <laughs> Thomas and Malik neighbors, why the hell would I throw the middle of the field either? I wouldn't. Right. So it's not that he couldn't. It's just, there was that funny narrative heading into this year, but you saw it was that. It, yeah, oh, you were just about to say that Zach Ertz throw. It's funny because they say he doesn't throw the middle of the field. Well, he just throws that dime right in front of Rokon Smith before he even hits his break. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, you're good. No, and I just want to talk about Zach Ertz, you know, hitting over the middle of the field, staying in front of the sticks, and he just – he's done a fantastic job. And I think as much attention as surrounded Jaden and the fun playmaking, right, the, even the Bears game is now flexed to 425 with a big spotlighting matchup against Caleb, and he's an electric playmaker – he wants to win inside of structure and inside the pocket. And he's coming to the line of scrimmage and making checks. He's talking to Biotish as far as protections. He's making audibles at the line of scrimmage. He's hitting Noah Brown at the ground and allowing him to make a play, throwing away from defenders. He's never late to the outside. It's always on that outside shoulder by the, by the boundary. It's just excellent stuff. And now he's also hitting guys. We saw it once against Cincinnati, but he's also now consistently hitting guys with free runners in his face. And that just shows me the type of guts, the type of accuracy, timing, poise, and just understanding from the neck up of what the heck he's looking at under center. So I'm right there with you, Kyle. Last, last week against Baltimore, I know it wasn't his most statistically advanced game ever. I know it was career high in passing yards. But what he's doing under center with his eyes and winning above the shoulders before he ever wins with his arm or with his legs continues to progress. It's been super impressive for Jaden so far. Yeah, I mean – to say how to be to say how excited I am right now is like not it's just an understatement honestly because like you know we're kind of like the the younger generation of fans so this is all kind of foreign to us we're like oh what's going on here <laughs> but um so you mentioned Jaden Daniels and obviously it looks like he's going to be the guy going forward like if he stays healthy for the next ten plus years here which thank you God but if you're the GM right now and you're Adam Peters you're looking at the landscape of the NFL. Obviously, there's been some some wheeling and dealing throughout the NFL with some other teams like Amari Cooper and Devontae Adams. But you're looking at this defense and maybe there's an edge guy out there or maybe there's a cornerback that's maybe you can have some control for the next couple of years. And you're looking at kind of like those Super Bowl window, that kind of window opening with the rookie quarterback, your franchise guy on the contract. If you're the GM, are you looking to add guys at the deadline or are you kind of sticking to your build it throughout the next couple of years plan and but you're just kind of ahead of schedule so but are you going to stick to your plan or are you going to maybe look to add somebody to kind of uh maybe speed up this process and help this defense out this year yeah that look mike that's an excellent question because i think that's i think that's where adam peters and his whole staff are at right now right i don't know if they sat here before the year to where you really the only guy on your roster or really two guys that you knew what you're going to get from is is Terry McLaurin and Bobby Wagner. Really, that's what you knew you were going to get. And Jaden was an unknown heading into the year. He's a rookie. We, we really didn't know what he was going to get from, from number five under center. And I think if they do make a move, I really don't expect to sit here and say 
They want to make a move for a J.C. Horn or a Denzel Ward or a Zadarius Smith if Cleveland's going to be sellers like they have been already with Amari Cooper to Buffalo. I don't know if we're going to see that type of move. Maybe it's a Jonathan Jones from New England, someone that's been thrown around here these last few days. That's a name. Um, is it a Zadarius Smith from Cleveland as a pass rusher, as a veteran that really hasn't lived up to expectations opposite of Miles Garrett? Is is that a name? So I just don't see a big splash from this unit right now. I just it is a tricky spot, Mike. And the reason why I said your question is so darn good is because that that really is a tough battle right now because this team is set up right now with not just Carolina and Chicago coming up, but the Giants, the two Eagles games, the two Dallas games are very, very winnable games. And of course, you got Tennessee, New Orleans, those types of games as well that are also going to be winnable. So you can very easily sit here, potentially first 10 games, be eight and two and sit here, not just potentially looking for the playoffs, That's like but maybe make some noise, you know, make some noise potentially. So it's a, it's a great question. And if I'm Adam Peters right now, if there's a move to make maybe on a lower level of guys, maybe send a five or a six to get a guy you think has some pop, maybe some young legs, maybe a Joseph Asai from Cincinnati, maybe that's the type of move that you make right now. My man. And now looking ahead to Carolina, Ryan, um, what is something that Washington has to improve in in order to beat Carolina? I was able to watch their game against Atlanta, and look, Andy Dalton was throwing some darts out there, man. And he, he's not playing slight, even though he does have seven touchdowns, four interceptions, and two fumbles so far. But he is throwing the rock well, getting the ball to Deontay Johnson, like you brought up in trade rumors. But what does Washington have to improve in in order to win this game on Sunday? Yeah, I, I as I mentioned earlier, I do think you have to stop Chuba Hubbard once he gets going. You know, that is where their offense is going to stem from. You know, he's also involved in the passing game a little bit. It really is true. him and Dante Johnson as that one-two show out there. Um, but it, for me, it is in the secondary. And I, I think it's going to force these guys to separate on the outside because I think week after week, and I'm not going to flack Benjamin St. Juice, and I'm not going to credit effort, but I think he's taken it on the chin a little bit. You know, covering Zay Flowers on crossing routes and man is – is really, really tough, and there's not many corners going to be able to do that, and they did a really nice job with mesh and rub routes and all they did last week against Baltimore. Yep. But Noah Igbenogany and Mike Sanders still, for me, continue to improve, specifically with Igbenogany week after week after week. And those are the guys against Deontay Johnson. You're going to see some Xavier Leggett, who was really good against Atlanta last week, getting more involved. Jonathan Mingo, they've really searched more for him. He's been two years away from being two years away as a kid. They drafted high out of Ole Miss a couple years ago. This group doesn't scare anybody, but as you mentioned, Kyle, with, with Andy Dalton, he's an NFL quarterback, and this is an NFL team, and they get paychecks on their stool every Monday morning as well. So I know we're really feeling good as far as scoring points, and this defense for Carolina has allowed 30-plus in the last three weeks consecutively, but it is the NFL, and it's not easy to win. We've maybe taken it granted for a little bit after the Arizona and Cleveland games. But just sticking to your fundamentals, putting points on the board when you can, and limiting this run game, I think, first things first, guys, stacking the box. We'll put Washington in a great spot to put this game away early, hopefully later portions of the third quarter. My man, now to wrap this up, I only have a couple more questions for you, Ryan. Uh, one thing I noticed from watching Carolina just a little bit, our DBs are going to have to come up and make a tackle. Uh, they're going to have to be physical in this game and be able to be reliable in that sense. But w looking at Carolina in particular – Brian Robinson is back at practice this week. What do you think the offensive identity should be in attacking Carolina's defense? Because J.C. Horn is very much like Jaden Daniels in a defensive mindset, very calm, cool, collected. And when he sees that ball that's floating out there, he's a heat-seeking missile. A very, He's a magnet to the football, a turnover machine, you could say. And that's somebody you do have to keep your eye on. So what would you say the offensive identity should be? Yeah, J.C. Horn's a dog. Yeah. outside uh, when he's healthy he's, he's a flat out dog he's an alpha on the perimeter um and that's good for carolina but who knows again who how long he'll be there as well um but for, from washington's perspective I, I do think it's a similar to how they approach the arizona game you know arizona had a very weak front seven carolina has a very weak front seven i think all three of the guys robinson eckler mcnichols and of course even Jaden's legs at a certain extent are going to have to really stem this offensive ground game again. I don't expect three, four, five touchdowns on the ground like we've seen it in weeks past, but I think you're trying to live in front of the sticks, you know, your second and fours, your third and threes, potentially taking shots down the field. They are going to take shots to Terry McLaurin. They're not going to stay away from J.C. Horn. You know, J.C., I believe, is allowed a touchdown as a primary man in coverage each of the last three weeks. I may be wrong on that, but I think he's been targeted a little bit. But overall, 
Right, ground game, ground game, ground game. The front five for the Commanders has been one of the top five units in football. They're meshing at, from left side to the right side. They're getting after people vertically and just moving people. And you have different skill sets. B-Rob, Eckler, McNichols, different kind of guys. All three guys, different skill sets. So ground games can be big again this week. And if they can turn it for over 200 yards, it's almost what Baltimore did towards the back end of last week's game, then do that and keep the pressure off of Jaden Daniels and keep him upright as much as you can and plan for Chicago. Yeah, and that goes to your point of liquidating the clock and being able to convert those points, uh, making Andy Dalton throw the football, right, and forcing Chuba Hubbard not to be able to have that many carries uh, like he talked about before. But last question I have for you, Ryan, three keys to victory for the Washington Commanders going against the Panthers. Yeah, I'll say first things first is is limit Chuba Hubbard. I'm never going to say stop a guy at the NFL level. It's the NFL. They're there for a reason. Um, he is their their weapon one. You know, I know Deontay gets a lot of attention on the outside, hell of a ball player, but do as much as you can to limit Chuba inside the box. Two is run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, and then turn clock. I know that goes hand in hand, run the ball, turn clock, but just I don't, I don't need 45 points on the board. I don't need it. Um, I don't need Jaden Daniels to have 50 attempts through the air and just throwing around the yard a little bit. Um, but I just, just run the ball, turn the clock, maybe get yourself a 27, 15, 27, 14, something like that type of win and to move on to Chicago and get back on the winning track. But, uh, also guys would not be shocked. Cliff Kingsbury, what we've seen so far for the first six weeks, take some shots downfield, let Jaden rip that thing. And maybe they put up 40 this week and just, you know, let everybody know what type of offense this is. Cause I think, I think Cliff has a little bit of arrogance now knowing what type of quarterback he's got under center. Yeah, and it's funny because, you know, people talk about this offense saying that Jaden Daniels only has to throw short. It's college offense. Well, right <laughs> now he's fifth yeah. in net yards per pass uh, with 7.3 per pass that he does complete. Last, real quick, yeah. um, Emmanuel Forbes, do you expect, because Carolina does go to empty set quite a bit, do you think that this could be a game where we're going to see Emmanuel Forbes, or do you think this can be more down the line? Let me say this, guys. Um I think the Emmanuel Forbes experiment is over mm. uh, in Washington. Um, I feel I feel bad for the young man. I do. Uh, I think the coaching, the development, I'm not going to blame it on that, but just a flat-out blown selection by the prior regime, it didn't work. I think moving in from this past April off-season workouts to training camp to give him an opportunity in the preseason and, and got beat in those moments, you know, this is a firm first-round pick. And I think missing on that selection, I'm not going to talk about the Christian Gonzalez stuff, but it's really set this secondary back two to three years. Um, if he's out there, I, I do think it's in a rotational role, potentially maybe three to four reps, like we saw Michael Davis last mm -hmm. week. I just, I don't think he's a part of the, the, the now. I don't think he's a part of the future. And and I, I, I do really wish the best for him, but I just don't see a future for Emmanuel Forbes. And it's crazy to say as a first round pick just last year. I, I just don't see it moving forward, Kyle. Yeah, if you don't have the speed, you got to have the mental game, put yourself in a good position. Uh, in case that happens. Ryan, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Right before you go, I'd just like to plug your social media handle in your show, just in case anyone watching hasn't followed you yet, brother. Absolutely. Commanding the Huddle is my podcast out two times a week. Podcast coming out tomorrow on all podcast platforms, previewing offense, defense, special teams of the Carolina Panthers. And then my social media on X, if you don't follow me there already, is at underscore Ryan Fowler. Yeah, you know, credit to you because uh, this returner for Carolina, he's no slouch, man. He's a tough runner, so I'm glad that you're going to highlight the special teams. I would hope everyone goes and watches that. Ryan, have a good night, sir. Enjoy the game this weekend. Appreciate it, guys. Appreciate it, Ryan. All right, everybody. We just spoke with the man, Mr. Ryan Fowler. We do have another guest coming up because I wanted to reach out to him again, and he's going to be here soon. Not quite yet, but somebody you're very familiar with. But somebody reached That's out and me. said, you know, why don't you guys team up with this guy on a weekly basis? And so I was like, you know what? Why don't I reach out more and more so in this sense? Because okay, we do have a great okay, connection. Okay. We do have a great connection with him. But that being said, the <laughs> it was crazy to see that that fight happen. It wasn't even a fight. That dude just randomly jumping those two dudes. And it was like, I don't lose. I, I, come <laughs> out and went to, I was like, you don't lose. He's like, you sure about that? Because then lost his job. No, that yeah. sucks, you know? That yeah, no, nah, I mean, look. Um, I told y'all to be careful. I told y'all to be careful when we left that yeah. last episode. Cancel culture. Yeah, no, nah, you did. You were actually 100% right. Even though they were just chilling, minding their own business, yep. according to what we saw from the video. Who knows what Poor guy was prior, in a Sean but... Taylor jersey. Like, out of, come know, on, right? man. <laughs> well, I wish the soul of Sean Taylor would have came out of him and just yeah. dropped that dude right back. But He did watch nah. that thing bland, though. He was like... You know, I know man, that was horrible. Nah, trust me, the dude kind of went out for a second. I was like, cool. Yeah. But no, nah, I mean, yeah, the dude's an idiot. 
to be flexing like I don't lose. Well, you lost in life because I know your dad has money apparently and all this other stuff, but it looks like you get fired from your job and all this other ridiculous stuff happened. But look, I'm not all about like the cancel culture and all that stuff, but when someone is just a horrible person and just an idiot of a human being, which it seems like this person is because the internet never loses, is undefeated. Got a whole background about the dude from a 10 second video, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, I mean, shout out to him for losing. Good job, buddy. My man. Now, before let's get into Carolina a little bit. This being a prepping episode for them. Are you concerned at all that this is almost going to be overlooked in looking ahead to Chicago because obviously the NFL flexed the Chicago game? Um, so there's like in years past, obviously, like that would be the whole narrative about this team going into this game is, oh, well, they showed out against Baltimore, whether they won the game, played hard, whatever, da 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 moral victory, whatever you want to call it. It would be, okay, this team's on the right path. They're going to get back on the winning track against a team that's one of the lowly teams in NFL. And then the letdown game comes. And while I will say there's not like – there's probably like a 2% of my mind that thinks that. I do think that the other 98% of me is thinking that when you got guys like Zach Ertz, Bobby Wagner, Austin Eckler, Terry, Deron, guys that have been here, that have been through the losing, that have been on that other side of the letdown game – and then you got guys in the uh, coaching staff like Dan Quinn, Anthony Lynn, guys that have been Cliff Kingsbury, guys that have been head coaches and know how to prep their guys, know how to get them on, get them in the mindset. I think Dan Quinn talked about it today. Get them in the mindset of mm-hmm. any given Sunday. Like it's a week, but it's week talked about this all the time. It's a week to week league. Yep. The Panthers can come out and play the best game of their lives. Yep. How are you going to respond to that? So it's not really about what the Panthers are going to do. I think Quinn also said this. it's not really about what the Panthers are going to do. It's about what are we going to do? How are we going to prepare? And I do think that with this coaching staff, this veteran leadership that's on the team, and a guy like Jaden Daniels, who you saw him sitting on the bench, like he looked pissed off that they lost that game. Which I, I don't like my... seeing that because he's usually smiling. He's usually having I, a good time. You know what I, I mean? I get that. But at the same time, I feel like I love that because that the competitor in him is like, I didn't play my – I could have – No, no, I'm not going to say it's a bad thing on yeah, him. Yeah, you know, no. I'm just saying personally I like yeah, to see the it's kids like smiling. That, it's like yeah. that Mamba, that killer mentality of yeah. – I know he's usually calm, cool, calm, collective, but I feel like he wanted to go out and show the – like everyone knows he's a beast. Everyone knows he's great, but I think he wanted to go out and show the world like this is my, this is my stepping stone platform to be like, hey, I, I'm, I've arrived in the NFL. And he came out on the wrong side of it, and I think that – that's just going to motivate him, kind of like I said, that MJ, that Kobe, that mama mentality of even if we win, win, lose, or draw, it's on to the next week, and how am I going to get better? What am I going to do to help this team win? So with that being said, I don't think it's going to be the letdown game. I think everyone's going to be focused in. Well, they have a slow – because I see them coming out maybe having like a slow start, maybe. But I think with the crowd being there, Dale Green's retirement ceremony, all that, alumni being back, a lot of alumni, I think that the crowd juice will – get them into the game quicker than quicker than uh than most games and that'll propel them to a uh a start good start very good job sir um one of the things that i had highlighted from watching a little bit of carolina versus atlanta carolina was at home last week and i saw three false starts um just in that first kind of stretch of the game and so the crowd noise i wrote down here is a need uh, for it because it does seem like their offensive line does struggle with that maybe it was just one game but if you're able to kind of help the defense out in that regard without a doubt we need we need the crowd noise we need that thing to be bumping we need everyone just like they were against Cleveland we need that tenfold let's make it very a very difficult environment for them to at, be comfortable in but do I think that they're overlooking it no and I would really I would really emphasize that you guys need to go watch the mic'd up of Andrew Wiley that just came out on YouTube not a couple hours ago. The last two or three minutes, the end of the game of the Ravens is going on, and Andrew Wiley and the t- team is on the sideline. And Terry McLaurin is coming up to Andrew Wiley saying, let's let's learn from this. He daps him up. Sam Cosme saying the same thing. Let's learn from this. Let's keep going. Like It's about how you bounce back. And so these guys, I, like your, to your point, 
I think the the Island of Misfit Toys, they wholeheartedly understand that they don't, don't just have it in the bag. And look, Carolina is in the bottom half of the league in almost every statistical category that I usually log on these. Uh, and on offense, red zone conversion rate is probably their best stat that they do have. They're 17th in the league. Points per game, 28th. Passing yards, they're 23rd. Rushing yards are 22nd. And third down percentage are 26th. And so if this is a time for the offense, I mean, for the defense to really kind of get back into that groove that they had against Cleveland, this is the time to do it. But that's why I wanted to include that. Andy Dalton is throwing that thing. He's throwing oh, yeah. the rock oh, yeah. and he's doing a damn good job at it. And so you can't fall asleep. You have to be able to come on top of this thing. And I really, truly believe that this team is not in the position or do they believe that they're in the position to overlook them going to Chicago? I think that Dan Quinn has been emphasizing this for weeks, saying it's one week at a time, just that week. That's what you emphasize, one play, and then you put all your effort in that one play, and the next play, same thing, all the emphasis on that. So, no, I don't think that it's going to be um, overlooked or anything like that. I think it's I think it's laughable at this point. This is still a growing young team. It wasn't that long ago that people were expecting to only win six games, and now we're sitting here saying we can overlook Carolina. We're not in that position. Let's keep yep. working, keep working, and let's keep piling up wins because that's when our quarterback is smiling, and that's what we really sure like. Did. Uh, before we are joined by our next guest real quick, uh, some keys to victory, you think? Um, I would say it's going to be the run game. Obviously, like Ryan talked about, this offense has basically been driven through the run game. With Brian. I think Brian Robinson being back this week is going to obviously help as well. But um, with B-Rob being back, the run game being back, I think um, getting back into the quarterback running game as well, because if you look at the past two weeks, um, Cleveland and Baltimore did, obviously Baltimore, did a great job with the quarterback run game and not letting Jaden get outside. And they were really good at setting the edge, making him bounce it outside to get to the sideline, pinching him to the sideline. So yeah, they did a they very can, good um, job at that. Yeah, so he either runs out of bounds or, you know, minimal game type stuff. So I think that uh, B-Rob being back, being like the punishing, I knew it was going to be street court, that's my guy. Um being like kind of the punisher, kind of like the bruiser, the bigger back to kind of uh, kind of wear the defense, kind of a la Baltimore, wear the defense down. And then you got a guy like Eckler, McNichols can come in, be the shiftier, kind of speedy guys. But, yeah, I think that uh, my main key would be just getting back to what they do on offense, which is running the ball, controlling the clock, and imposing their will on the offensive line up front. Absolutely. Um, my one one key that I would put in here is the DB's tackling. Uh, Carolina is they're going to go outside for their run plays they are going to attack that area of the field and our DBs have to be willing to come up be physical and make those tackles I know Chris Comerton or discord was talking about Benjamin St. Just and his kind of effort and aggressiveness and going up and get Henry which is one thing I me mean, it's Derek freaking Henry but it's <laughs> not like that emphasis wasn't there the entire time my other need is the physicality in all breath because, yeah, you could say walking into this, you could overlook Carolina, but this isn't a time to do that. This is the time to afflict your will to really showcase what you're about. Because if you are physical in every sense of the game, then you're in a very, very, very good position to be putting up points. And so, in my, in my opinion, being physical in this game is more so evident than ever. Because we, we all know, like going back to the Chicago Bears game of last year, Chicago wasn't highly talked about going into that Monday night game. And then they blew the doors off us. That's what you want to avoid at all costs going against Chicago at 405. Now we are joined by our next guest, good friend, Mr. Street Scores Rico. Thank you for joining us, brother. How you doing? Yes, sir. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm good. What's good, y'all? Hey, not not much, man. We're just we're top of the NFC East, another beautiful day. Uh <laughs> yeah. autumn autumn is definitely in full effect up here. Uh, it's very chilly. I love it. Absolutely love it. And so we just listed a couple of our keys to Victory Street. What what are some of yours? Um, even just continuing with their uh, the, like the, the potential of this being a trap game, you know, most years I probably would be concerned, but it seems like even going to, to that Browns game, we uh, people were starting to assume their offense is terrible. We may play a little lackluster, and then that was even with a great defense that we will at least a better defense than we faced previously. I mean, they were on pace to put up the most points they put up all season, and 
And so I feel like just with all of the leaders we have from the players, Bobby Wagner, even though Jonathan Allen's gone now, but like Terry McLaurin, Zach Ertz, we have Austin Eckler that have been there, done that in every way possible to the coaching staff, to the front office, guys like Adam Peters that have gone to Super Bowls, won Super Bowls and things like that. I think if there was any organization that just makes sure that that message gets sent from top to all the way to the bottom throughout um, I feel like it would be our organization. So I'm not too worried about it, but it is something that we need to be aware of. Don't just overlook them because the Bears have a good defense and we're already looking ahead two weeks with the Caleb Williams versus Jaden Daniels. That's already been flexed. So, you know, the NFL is excited. I'm pretty sure the players are as well, but you cannot ignore these these hungry Panthers right now. Where's guys out there fighting for their futures? Because, I mean, this season is probably cooked for them, especially with all the injuries. Seems like every week they get another front seven starter hurt for the rest of the season. Um, and I, I feel like they're going to play very hungry. They're, they're out here fighting for their next contracts. Absolutely. And the other key I would say is almost exactly like what Ryan was saying is limiting Chuba Hubbard as much as you possibly can. Obviously, losing Jonathan Allen, it's going to they're most likely going to try to attack that in the middle of the field and then try to go outside. But a lot of the Carolina's big pass plays comes off of their play action bit. And so if you're not as scared in that game of the play action pass, then you're in a good position for your guys to get back. If you know it's handled up front, you'll need to keep your eyes up there. Then you are at more emphasis to get backwards. And so that's probably one of my bigger keys here is just not allowing them behind you because Deontay Johnson and this offense, they're no slouches. I know statistically they're probably not the best in the league, but they can hurt you. And they Atlanta learned that early on in that game. But Street, we have our first question submitted on Twitter by Just Your Average Fly Guy. Over 13 hours ago, he sent this in. He said, right now, Helen Keller sees our defense will be our downfall if everything stays the same. I don't see AP going out and spending money or, or assess before the trade deadline. What do y'all see as realistic low-key fixes that can help this year? Yeah, I mean, maybe they'll keep bringing more and more guys in for workouts. Because, um, I mean, other than that, I think maybe you trade for a, a young, really talented corner that's on a losing team. Maybe, I mean, in our case, like we talked about last show, J.C. Horn of the Panthers, don't even let him leave the DMV after this game, in my personal opinion. But if I'm being very realistic, I mean, we just gave Kyle Fuller a workout. It must not have went well with the fact that we didn't sign him, but we did sign, uh, I think his name was Carl Davis, I believe it was, the defensive tackle. And I mean, maybe you continue to do that because I don't think there's just a corner in free agency just laying around that's going to be better than what we have. First of all, just talent wise, but also just how long it would take for them to learn the system and things like that. So if you do plan on making a move at corner, it's more than likely going to have to be via trade before the trade deadline. And hey, say hi. Can you say hi, Corey? Hi. <laughs> it was very <laughs> slight. <laughs> Your name is hey. Cash. What's up? They can't see you, Cash. You want to lean in a little bit more? You say hi. Hi. Say hi, Street. Hi, Mike. Um, I agree with you. I'm not sure about <laughs> low-key fixes, I think, is all on this team. Because in my personal opinion, I don't think adding a corner is going to fix the pass defense. Well, I think the best thing well, possible well, you can well, do. Well, oh, is that a car? The best thing you could possibly do is have a good, consistent pass rush. And obviously losing... Dorrance Armstrong does not help in that regard whatsoever. And so I think that Jonathan Allen obviously being out is, is key, but I think this much more so of guy taking, guys taking their opportunity and maximizing it, i.e. Fedarian Mathis, i.e. Um, my boy Johnny McClain Newton, being able to get after the passer through the interior of the defense, because last week that was the big issue for me, is that they were not able to fluster Lamar more than they, they needed to. And so for me personally, I don't think that the fixes are necessarily going to be just adding a player on the outside, because if you're allowing a wide receiver three to four seconds to get open on a play, it doesn't matter who your corners are. It's much more exactly. so being able to pressure the quarterback. And I think that's more of the emphasis for me personally, fly guy. Yeah. No, um, like you guys said, at this point in the season, unless you're spending some top notch, like uh, assets, like a first or second round pick or, even like a high third round pick, maybe like that Dolphins pick that we got via the trade with John Dotson from the Eagles, then um, you're probably not going to really enhance your team like that much. Like unless you're getting like a, like I said, like a guy that's going to be a difference maker with a high asset pick. And knowing the uh, history of guys like Adam Peters and Lance Newmark, who have been with the Lions, been with San Francisco, they like to build through the draft and then add the pieces once they've got those the foundation laid with their couple drafts so i would think that maybe like i mean 
they're not going to trade anybody in the offseason. But I would think that this offseason, with the progression of Jaden Daniels, the progression of the team, what they're looking like, with the money that we have, we have, I think, nine total draft picks, four in the top 100. I think this, this offseason is going to be the time when you're going to see them go out there and make some moves, maybe do some wheeling and dealing, sign some guys. But as far as trades go, I, would, I mean, if they're going to go out and get a cornerback, like some of the guys that Ryan Fowler listed off, I would be okay with that. But like you said, Kyle, I would think that they would want to secure maybe like the defensive line or like the edge rusher position, a guy that can get after the quarterback so that you're actually helping your your defensive backfield by adding a guy up front, like you said. So, um, yeah, if they're going to add a guy, I would say that it's going to be up front on the in the trenches. But I also could see them – just staying pat and just rolling with what they got because they're already ahead of schedule anyway. And they are. And, get- and to your point, to your point about like if we may just stay pat. Remember, I, I believe the Houston Texans didn't really make many changes. They saw CJ Stroud. They saw they were having the season they did last year. They didn't really dive deep into like adding a like major talent until after the season was over, yeah. where they got in Stephon Diggs and uh, um, and uh, uh, Daniel Hunter. And so they just kind of rolled with it. And maybe Adam Peters will just follow that same formula for this season. See just where it goes. Yeah, and, and to your guys' credit, Jordan McGee is activated. He is practicing at the moment. And so that's somebody adding to linebacker core. You could maybe use Frankie Louvre more in a free sense of being able to get yeah. after the passer sure. and not as much so, much more so in coverage. But we have to see how Jordan McGee looks, him obviously being a rookie. But obviously, Ken Norton and company really like this kid and what he can provide and contribute to this defense so maybe that's another avenue you can go down just to be able to create a little bit more pressure because even though like the the Ravens are very good up front but when we did send pressure it wasn't like it was very actively getting after Lamar on a consistent basis and that's much more so of my mindset going forward especially in the back end and of course our corners have to play better of course but also helps when um you know guys aren't tripping and we're getting flagged for it you know now street (laughs) uh one of your biggest fans the colonel has the next question for you He says, please give me a realistic outlook of the loss of John Allen for the season. Specifically comment on how the loss of his pass rushing skills would will negatively impact our defensive secondary. Well, we kind of, yeah, we just did kind of. Yeah, basically. But um, I'm worried about that. And But I believe Johnny Newton can help a lot because you even saw against the Ravens, it was like early into the game, he got like off with some really good ball get off. He was very explosive. The thing with Johnny Newton is that he's going to be better at penetration. What I'm worried about with losing Jonathan Allen, and, and I haven't seen this necessarily yet from Johnny Newton, is the strength to like, you know, stack up against an offensive lineman and then get rid of them like two gapping. Like right now, Jonathan Allen is still the better two gapper if you need them to make sure either side of him, whether the running back, keep your head up, look at where the running back's going and then make a play on that. Johnny Newton is great ball snap. I'm in the backfield. That's what he's better at. But when it comes to like run stopping and, you know, trying to keep the linebackers clean, I think that's what we'll really be miss Jonathan Allen most importantly but yeah he'll, I mean even just leadership wise I feel like he'll be missed as well I mean it's definitely game planning as well Colonel um Jonathan Allen took a lot of double teams and so these other guys are going to be faced with those double teams Johnny Newton um probably is probably used to it from his time in Illinois but this being the NFL this is a different animal so he, he every defensive tackle defensive end they know what to do when they are double teamed but Johnny Newton, there was a play I put out on Twitter today where he's actually double teamed and then the right guard goes over to the edge rusher and Johnny Newton wraps around the line of scrimmage, is able to go upfield at Lamar Jackson and forces Lamar to come forward, which then allows Dante Fowler to come in and tackle him. So the one thing about Johnny Newton is he has that high motor. And so you do I do expect for him to continue fighting to be able to get in the backfield. I'm not saying Fedarian Mathis doesn't, but Johnny Newton has that extra gear that Fedarian Mathis doesn't, right? And so that's one avenue that you could probably feel really good about in the pass rushing sense. But with the other guys, you that is kind of a concern. Deron Payne hasn't been seeing as many double teams as Jonathan Allen was. So D Payne better get ready for it. And obviously we don't need stats for Deron Payne to be amazing or to be consider him one of the elite in the NFL. But we do expect that when he gets those one-on-one matchups that you win those and you get back there. And so if, if it is Johnny Newton, that's free with that one-on-one matchup. I, I have full confidence that he's going to win that. And so, yes, there is going to be a slight drop off, but we also have to be realistic in the sense is John Allen wasn't truly known for his pass rushing skills. It was much more so of his run stuffing, his motor on the outside to be able to know things, but also his high motor to be able to get out to the quarterback when things broke down a little bit. So just have to be somewhat realistic, but we are going to miss John just from a game planning perspective, in my opinion. 
Yeah, I think it's just going to come down to an experience thing. Like John's been there. He's done that. He's seen a lot of different blocking schemes, a lot of different type of like pulling schemes and stuff like that. So I think it's just going to come down to like Jonathan now can be like, okay, they're pulling this guy and they're blocking it this way. I can pull my leverage this way. Or I've seen this type of blocking scheme before. I know what run is, what type of run is coming my way and I, I can know how to play it. But so I think that'll be the main thing they're going to lose as far as like Johnny Newton just doesn't really have that experience in the NFL of, oh, I've seen this before. I've seen that before. I know how to play this type of leverage if he's doing this to me. I know how to do this type of move or hit him with this type of hand move if he's doing me like this type of way. So I just think that uh, – and then like Street said, maybe he's uh, he's known as like a guy that can get get off the ball real quick, get upfield. Maybe they take advantage of that with a lot of like trap schemes and like trap runs and stuff like that. So where as a guy like Jonathan Allen knows like let me – play my scheme let me like play my two gap let me do this that and the third to kind of like you said kind of hold the defender up hold the lineman up throw him to the side get after the uh get after the runner so i think that uh the only good thing the only positive of this is a guy like johnny newton does get those reps he does get more playing time so that towards the second half of the season down the stretch and then going to the next year okay now it's like okay we have fully trust that we he knows what to do in the scheme He's seen this, that, and the third on the field, so he can play it this type of way. So if you want to look at a positive of Jonathan Allen, because there is definitely a lot of negatives in him being out, the only positive is a guy like Johnny Newton gets that exposure, and it kind of speeds up his process as far as, like, um, production. Very violent yeah. hands, man. Going back to Illinois, he was very violent. Yeah. Sorry, Steve. I was just saying, even to that point, because um, I just remember, you know, I used to be a big Westbrook fan, and, you know, Reggie Jackson was, like, really like an afterthought to anybody outside of the, the act people that actually watched all Oklahoma city fans. As soon as Westbrook had that one season, he was hurt. That's when Reggie Jackson finally like had his opportunity. Yeah. He had the time, he had the snaps and all of that with well, the basketball equivalent. And then he turned into what he told, you know, being a star for a short period of time. And, and I feel like Johnny Newton, that can definitely pay large dividends um, long-term. Yeah. And dude, even uh, James Harden was like coming off the bench yeah. for Oklahoma city. And obviously he ended up becoming one of the, better guys getting max contracts out the butt. And he was a backup for them at the beginning, at the very beginning. Now, yeah. the next question for our street scores is from the Colonel. Are either of our new signings at defensive tackle and cornerback noteworthy? Or are we just desperately plugging holes? I mean, I, I see the strategy. Like right now they're bringing in former Dallas Cowboys. At least a couple of them have been and. Maybe that'll make the transition at least somewhat smooth. It's not, I, we're not bringing in the most talented guys. We're bringing guys that know the system and know what Dan Quinn and Joe Wood Jr. want. So there's at least somewhat of a floor going into this Panthers game. But, um, I mean, it, it's it's not like the best group of guys. I'm not trying to sell you a dream that we just found John, Jonathan Allen's replacement or anything <laughs> like that. Um, but we'll we'll see how it goes because I remember Carl Davis when he used to play. Um, I forgot somebody put up a tweet and I thought it was hilarious because it reminded me that like <laughs> you basically played whichever running back was going against a Carl Davis played defensive line that week in fantasy just a couple of years ago because he just hasn't been good at stopping the run so far in his career. Um, so that definitely concerns me. But right now he's the one on the practice squad. We ended up actually signing. Um, Sheldon Day up from the practice squad. Yep. He's been on the practice squad for a few weeks. So that's the guy that we really need to look towards to see if he can um, step up big time for us. But Absolutely. again, I'm not expecting anybody to replace Jonathan Allen, but, you know, at least contribute. Absolutely. And just being able to clog up those rush lanes, especially going against Chuba Hubbard, and then next week with DeAndre Swift as well. Um, I think Jalen Holmes, the defensive an uh, lineman that they got from the Jets, Dan Quinn specifically brought him up in the presser today talking about how the Jets head coach, a defensive coordinator now, I actually reached out and texted him saying, we're going to miss Jalen Holmes. And so he kind of said that spoke a lot because typically when you get those texts, that generally means a good thing. And so I think Jalen Holmes is somebody that I'm not going to say he's going to come in and start getting you sacks every single game. I just much more so you could feel confident if that guy does step in, like in a Javante Jean Baptiste kind of way, uh, John Baptiste, where you know that you could feel confident in it. And so if the Jets are defensive uh, coordinators feeling that way. I feel good about it. But yes, they are plugging holes because they lost Javante. He's on IR along with Dorrance Armstrong, who's now going to miss some time. We don't know how much, but also you, you need those bodies. And of course, these are guys that are not overly well known. You are plugging holes, but you're going to need those holes in a deep rotation, which is what Dan Quinn and company like on the defensive line. 
Yeah, I mean, like you guys said, it's not guys that are going to blow your socks off. It's not guys that are going to be coming and you just unearth like an unearth gym that is going to be right. the next, the next double digit sack guy, the next All Pro like Pro Bowl type player for your team. Is you that there's pretty much bringing in guys that have been around the league for veteran guys that have been in the league for five, six, seven, eight plus years that know how to play NFL football, probably know somewhat, some way what to do in this type of scheme with Dan Quinn and Joe Witt. So it's just guys that are veterans that are, if their name is called, going to be able to hopefully at least contribute somewhat as opposed to a guy that you're just like forcing in there that you need production from. And so, yeah, I don't I don't think it's going to be out of you. It's going to be like, oh, we're going to re-sign that guy next year to a long-term deal. It's just more of, like you said, plugging holes to kind of get us through the Dorrance Armstrong and uh, other injuries. Yeah, now b- before we get into our predictions for this game this Sunday, let's get into the last couple questions that we have in the Discord. This one from Andy Lockhart in the UK in the One Oy. Point Safety Show. Oi! Andy asks, Rico, are you getting a Taco Bell in your home? <laughs> What is that? A Taco Bell? They sent in this thing early. I guess Taco Bell bought a house and they put like, like literally like you can make chalupas and stuff in there and everything like they, I, I don't know all the specifics behind it, but I did see <laughs> it. They sent that in there and you thought it was funny. <laughs> That's cool. I mean, if they send it for free, I'll take it. Right. <laughs> no, I don't even like the smell. Like it reminds me of high school when we used to like, you do that out of school lunch. You used to walk, we used to walk over to Taco Bell for lunch. I always remember that smell. You know, I can eat those quesadillas all day long, but you know, I don't want to ruin a good thing. So no, I don't want, I don't want to talk about my home. Uh, everyone knows that, that, that can be a recipe for disaster. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't even remember the last time I've been to Taco Bell. I go like once in the blue moon. So yeah, like I you can't said, tell I you the last having, time I had Taco Bell for real. Yeah, having it in my house, I feel like would just like kind of spoil the, like the quesadillas that are like so banging when I get them or like chalupas. So good. But, like, I'd be crushing chalupas, but like I said, I haven't been there in so long that, like, I wouldn't want to go, like, every day if I had one in my house. Like, that'd be horrible. My man. <laughs> now, the next question, uh, Street, this is from Deluxe. The defense is getting a lot of sky is falling heat this week. Do you have hope, like like I do, that they can improve? Saw correctable mistakes that gave up 30 to a team that averages 29 and a half. Did you see the same? What positives, if any, did you see? I mean, there's a lot to take away from that game. First of all, in the beginning of the game, outside of that one, like, huge screen play, and then we kind of got bailed out by the interception with Mark Andrews dropping an easy catch, but um, they were actually pretty solid against the run to start. They were very physical and things like that. It's just kind of like the Ravens pivoted. They changed their game plan up a little bit. We just weren't ready to – We they counterpunched us. We weren't ready to counter back is what it felt like. But um, I feel like, I mean, of, of course there's no consolation prizes, but at the same time, I mean, that's arguably one of the – best offense in the NFL right now, especially just matchup wise. Like, what do you do when you are stopping Derrick Henry alone, whether it's be in, in between the, 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 from the, the gaps and everything like that from in between the tackles, but then they ran a lot of tosses against us. And so like to have that lateral speed and an agility and awareness to catch him on the outside as well, then you got to worry about Lamar Jackson, his arm, his legs and things like that. That's just a very difficult matchup for any team in the NFL. I feel like honestly, when the Ravens don't score, it's more of them, making mistakes than a defense actually you know playing very well because the Ravens have the type of offense especially talent wise this season compared to other seasons where they can beat you so many ways you just got to hope that they pick the wrong answer and you got to hope that you pick the right answer um and so I don't feel like the sky's falling because I just feel like naturally Brown's worst offense in the NFL we're going to look amazing Ravens arguably best offense in the NFL you're going to look bad and I just feel like we're somewhere in the middle but most importantly we're improving because I feel like if we played the Ravens week one it would have been even worse yep. than what it was you're absolutely right about that street scores and what positives that I see from it well first is the handsy football the heads up football by Mikey Samra still uh that one opportunity that was in front of their face they got it you could say negative was Bobby Wagner not seeing the ball literally at his feet (laughs) I don't think he just literally (laughs) believed that that was possible maybe he thought that was a shoe or something um but I think he was just looking for the snap running and he was like where where, where to go (laughs) but like like that thing where it's opportunities are there and they're taking advantage of it and that's something that that it is a positive going forward but also the other positive I would say was their ability to keep Lamar from changing that game on the ground if I'm not mistaken Lamar is like top 10 in the NFL overall in rushing yards I think he has over like 400 yards rushing so it's absolutely insane he did have one big carry on that one designed run 
But when it came to the structure of the play, didn't, they didn't allow him to be able to maneuver and do what he needed to do. They kept him consolidated, and that's one good thing looking forward whenever you're going against a very mobile quarterback. Obviously, Andy Dalton isn't that, but I do think that is a major positive. And to your credit, Street, obviously the Ravens did have some uh, really good success on the ground on the outside, and that's one of the reasons why I'm saying the DBs have to be physical and come up and make plays and tackles in this game because I feel like Carolina is going to go after that hardcore. What about you all? Um, yeah, positives are they got their first uh, interception. They finally got a turnover. The turnover's going, so that's hopefully uh, will be a trend that continues throughout the rest of the season. Um, as far as, like, the sky's falling, like, the only thing I have real concern, I would say, going forward is if you have an above average number one wide receiver, you're probably going to go off on us just because we don't really have <laughs> – we don't really have the personnel up front to get after the quarterback – and we don't really have the personnel on the back end to kind of hold up when they're not getting any pass rush. So I would just say that uh, – but we kind of knew that going into the seasons. I don't think anything's really changed on that front. It's just right. more of can they just keep gelling in the in the turnover category to kind of uh, like kind of set – like uh, default the kind of big plays, the big chunks are going to give up, maybe the long drives are going to give up. But if you're getting turnovers, getting the ball back to the offense – I think that's the the one positive you can maybe take away uh, from this defense is they can keep getting turnovers, getting the ball back to Jaden and Cliff in this offense, or to get the ball back to B-Rob to eat some more clock up, keep them off the field, then I think that'll be uh, good for them. But, yeah, as far as, like, any concerns, it's the same ones you had in the beginning of the season. My uh, last question that we have submitted, Street, before we get into our prediction, Tim Towner asks, can you grade A, B, C, D, or F each player drafted in 2024 so far on his play. Let's start. I mean, Jaden Daniels, obviously <laughs> A plus. F. Johnny Newton, we're seeing fl- <laughs> Johnny Newton, we're seeing flashes. Uh, I think um, all of the second round guys like Johnny Newton, you're seeing flashes. Mike Sanders still is getting better and better. And even Ben Sinney, he hasn't been featured in the passing game, which I hope will happen. Maybe that's something Cliff Kingsbury is keeping into his back pocket. You know how you know defenses tend to catch up to him half, halfway through the season. Maybe the Luke McCaffrey and Ben Sinney breakout is on the way, especially because Luke McCaffrey is always open, which, I'll, of course, I'm going to talk about soon when I get to him. But Ben Sinney has been blocking very well for us. Him and John Bates have been excellent in blocking Vincent even making plays in special teams um so I guess like a hopeful B I mean I can't give them an A because it's not like they balled out mm-hmm. but you're seeing the potential um and then when it comes to Brandon Coleman he's getting better now granted isolated like against Miles Garrett. he had a great game overall against Miles Garrett but if you really look at the tape it was Luke McCaffrey coming in to help like five times I think in that game the tight ends helped as well at times he's still doing a good job he's still learning um so maybe you can give him a slightly higher grade than the the previous three draft picks just off of the fact that he's contributed a little bit more even though he's technically not even starting yet so splitting snaps with Cornelius Lucas and then Luke McCaffrey's open a lot we just need Jaden Daniels to basically see him more often I think he'll start to explode onto the scene once that starts to happen um but, but that's just because Terry McLaurin's getting a lot of the attention and all of these guys um, and then um, Jordan McGee was still waiting. Dominique Hampton inactive because he's trans. I mean, to the transition from basically free safety at Washington to now basically an off ball linebacker is a huge leap. Um, so I'm not surprised he hasn't played yet. And then um, lastly, Javante John Baptiste, as soon as he started the flash, now he's hurt. <laughs> yep. And I would I would give Javante a B just based on him being a seventh round pick, him coming in and contribute the way they did. He was getting a plethora of snaps. I would give him a B. I think Luke McCaffrey is a C plus without a doubt. I've, but like you can even say he gets a B or an A just because he hasn't dropped anything. I think he's had 12 targets. He's caught all 12. Yeah, it's 11 just targets, went, 11 catches. He's done really well in blocking. So I do think he does deserve the A. But the only reason I said a C plus was because he hasn't been utilized in the sense where you can literally walk away saying, that guy's a solidified A, if that makes sense. Like I want to have the A grade to have some substance for J- for Jaden Daniels. Like that is legit substance that you're getting out of that. That is a freaking A. And Brandon Coleman, I would say a B minus. Uh, you have he hasn't been playing to the caliber to the point where he can push Cornelius Lucas out of the way. And so I do think that warrants the B minus. Uh, Mikey Samron still, uh, I think he does deserve a B plus just because of. They have moved him. Obviously, we were getting targeted in the run game with him whenever he was on the inside. 
Moving him to the outside was a genius move. I loved it. I wholeheartedly believed in it. And then he's exceeded expectations on the outside. They're not something he is used to in college or in the pros. And he came in and has answered the call and done really well out there. And so I think he is a B-plus without a doubt. And uh, Javante, obviously, I said a B. And then Dom hasn't been out – really hasn't been out there much except for special teams. And then with uh, Jordan McGee, we haven't seen him. So it's that's a question mark. I'll leave that there. Hall, do you have any differences for predictions? Um, no, not really. McGee and Hampton, like you said, I give those like an IA just because like an incomplete because they haven't really played a lot. Uh, I would say McCaffrey, I'd give him just a solid B just because, like I said, 11 catches or 11 targets, 11 catches. If you look at the tape, we run it back sometimes. You can see he's running wide open. It's just a matter of seeing him on the field. Um, like you said, Ben Sennett, great blocking. He's had a couple of times where he's been running free, just hasn't really been seen on the by Jaden. So, I mean, yeah, I'd probably give Brandon Coleman, like you said, B minus because he's not fully starting yet, but he's definitely progressing. Um, yeah, for the most part, I agree with all the all the grades y'all gave everybody. All right, let's get into our predictions real quick. I want to list the stats and where these guys are. First, I'll start with Carolina. Carolina's red zone conversion percentage: they are 17th in points per game on offense. They're 28th. They're 23rd in passing yards, 22nd in rushing yards, and 26th in third down percentage. On defense, they are 31st in the red zone. They are 32nd, last in the league in points per game allowed on defense, 23rd in passing yards, 30th in rushing yards, and 30th on third down conversion percentage. Now, Washington, they're 14th in the red zone. They're tied for second in points per game. They are 13th in passing yards, 5th in rushing yards, and 2nd on third third down percentage conversion rate. On defensively, in the red zone, we're 29th in, and then 22nd in points per game, 19th in passing yards, 22nd in rushing yards, and 29th in third down conversion rate. So that being said, Street, what is your prediction for this game? Yeah, I'm definitely predicting, I mean, maybe they get 13 points on offense. Those numbers are worse than I thought. I mean, I guess that's <laughs> that's what happens when you lose top playmakers in free agency. I mean, we took Jeremy Chin and Frankie Louvu from them, and then they've sustained all of these injuries. So I guess that's the byproduct of that. Plus, your offense is not good. Defense on the field, they're going to give up points. Um, but I'm thinking that I think that we maybe give them 13, and I can see us easily scoring somewhere in the 30s and possibly even sitting Jaden Daniels early in the fourth quarter again because we definitely want to keep guys, especially Brian Robinson, too. Brian Robinson looks like he's going to play. If we have a successful offensive day, you just go ahead and rest him early as well. Absolutely. What's your score prediction? I'm going to go 34-13. I'm going to go 34-13. Okay, very well, very well, sir. Um, I will go with 31 31- to six they shouldn't score a touchdown <laughs> if i'm perfectly honest with you um <laughs> yeah, just ba- look this is a very good offense i do expect for them to be able to move the football get down the field and they're no slouch but w- for washington and my expectations of them in the physicality they should be able to halt these guys and obviously them being really bad in the red zone conversion or in the third down conversion rate that should be an area that Washington takes a step forward in. Obviously, they were last in the league at one point defensively. Now they've moved up to 29th, and that didn't help because Baltimore obviously uh, had that. But I would I would imagine it's going to be similar to what we saw against Cleveland, where it was uh, what we allowed, like one of 12 or something like that. It was an astronomical number. And that's what we need to get back to. And so I think that that wholeheartedly is what's going to happen in this game. So I think that we're going to win this game 31-6, to and I wouldn't be surprised to see what you talked about with Jaden Daniels and Brian Robinson. I don't want to get ahead of my skis, but just in my expectations of this team, this is where they should be, and this is what they should be doing based on the stats that were provided. You have expectations now to live up to them. You don't have the ability to sleep. And so this is the game where you get back to it and you get a good feeling from it. Because I know that they're feeling that Ravens loss, but you can't let it bleed into this. You got to take that anger, that frustration out on Carolina. You cannot allow just to sit back and chill. And I think that we have the coaching staff to not allow them to. And also, I just thought about the fact that that was the exact score that I gave for the Browns game. So I'm going to switch it to 38-13. Just because okay. I, I highly doubt the chances that we'll have the exact same score again. <laughs> Never know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, it's going to be a close, like close game in the first half and, you know, maybe they're up by like a point or two, maybe we're up by a couple points in the first half. But I think in the second half, we come out, put the foot on the gas, put the foot on their neck and eventually just pull off on them, pull away from them. I'll go, 
Washington. Mm, I'll say Washington, like 28, and Carolina, 13. Okay. Well, low scoring in the sense for Washington. Oh, I understand your, what you're feeling there. It's That's weird. crazy. We can say that. 28 yeah. points is low scoring for us. I know, this right? right. <laughs> I mean, whenever Ryan earlier was talking about, like, looking like, like, not to look too far ahead, but, like, the next couple of games, like, going into our division stuff, it's like we could be, like, sitting at 8-2 and two in week, I guess it would be week 11 at that point, which is just, like, legitly mind-blowing to say out loud. But this is well, where we are in life. Yeah, look, and it's much more so of not what Carolina can do to you, but much more so of what can you do to Carolina. And based off the stats that have been provided, this offense should dictate this game. Our offense should be able to control the clock, get down the field, score touchdowns at a, at a high rate, and be able to force that Carolina offense out of the rushing attack. If you're able to do that, I think that it's well attainable that they don't score a touchdown, but that's up to our defense, our offense, and it's up to our defense to be able to get off the field. And I feel like they have a... They, they know that, and they, they want to be able to – they're ready for it, if that makes sense. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap us up for this episode. I'm Kyle. I'm Hall. She, she scores. My man, I didn't know if you were going to say it or not. <laughs> Enjoy the game this weekend. If you are going, Hall, I hope you are going. I'm not sure if you pulled the plug on that. I don't know. I'm still, still in the uh, no. production phases of this. It's but the Dale Green retirement – game come I'll know on by like to, honestly i'll probably know by like tomorrow but we'll see all right you make sure you go and anybody that's going make sure you guys get rowdy you get you get loud and uh you have a very good time just don't go seeking panthers fans out after the game <laughs> for whatever i know you I guys would because you guys are fantastic people you don't go out looking for weak people to try to go inflict your will on just enjoy the game enjoy the victory and just uh look ahead obviously to next week but hope you guys have a good time be safe all right We'll see you guys then. Washington football. Woo! Peace. What's up, everyone? This is Kyle from the Burgundy Zone. We are releasing our own merch to support the show. If you want to rock the Burgundy Zone logo or you want to see Reed's face on your shirt, we got it. We're starting with T-shirts, hoodies, and zip up. So if you're a fan of the show, make sure you snag one before they are gone. Check out the link in our bio on Instagram, or you can find the link in the description of the video. Thanks again for all your support. Until next time.